So um, my experience with ocean noise kind of charts back to 2012 or so when I was doing my dissertation on the north coast of British Columbia. And I was actually working at a volunteer amateur whale listening station called Cetacea Lab, which is also located in these proposed shipping lanes uh, for liquefied natural gas or LNG. So the ocean noise issue was quite palpable because you could hear the sound of transiting cargo and different kinds of ships literally from the island where we were listening for whales. And that also um, brought in the, the kind of strong relation that I've since looked at uh, continuously over the next few years around ocean noise or anthropogenic underwater sound and whales in particular. Whales as a certain species that attracts all sorts of attention, environmental, political, economic, and so forth uh, in relation to this issue. Hopefully you can see my um, screen now. You can't see it, okay. Um, let me try this again. Share screen. Okay. There we go. Great, thank you. Thank you to whoever's helping me with those uh, prompts. So the, there are really three uh, core dynamics, I think, that uh, explain this strong relationship between ocean noise regulation, politics, uh, and environmental concern, and whales in particular. Uh, the most obvious of those three is the environmental one, which is to say whales are one of the most charismatic species in the world and have long been seen as avatars of ecological health and well-being, uh, inspiring films, inspiring music, and of course, inspiring you know, fervent environmental protection. The second is epistemological or knowledge related. It's the idea that uh, we can learn a lot about no ocean noise, uh, how far it travels, uh, the range of different impacts it solicits on animals. Uh, through whales, through the impacts that they display, the different ways they display those impacts. And this history is, is quite a long one. It doesn't uh, only include the recent issues around ocean noise. It dates back to the middle of the 20th century, if not before then, uh, largely because of the Cold War and the uh, incredible amount of work that went into the study of whales in relation to submarine warfare. And I'll get into that in a little bit later on. Uh, and the third one is economic. And this is the most complicated of the three, I think. We generally think of ocean noise and whales in terms of economic costs, which is to say whales pose regulatory risks for shipping agents or other kinds of economic actors because they uh, demand protections, whether they're protected areas or different kinds of reductions in activity. But I wanna argue that there's another dynamic here that needs to be paid attention to, which has to do with the possibilities for economic value, which is to say that the study of ocean noise not simply a cost, is also an opportunity for money-making, for profit-seeking, uh, and in ways that are complicated because they don't necessarily bring uh, actors in, in in ways that they intend. But there's an, a market basis for the way in which science proceeds today in a large part, and that creates opportunities to make money from the study of an issue which is ultimately damaging the health of whales. So the official narrative um, really coheres around this notion that Sylvia Earle, an environmentalist, coined in 1994, which is that a deaf whale is a dead whale. Uh, this is the idea that ocean noise uh, in reducing the ability of animals like you know, humpback whales and uh, killer whales and different kinds of uh, baleen whales and other kinds of whales to navigate the ocean area um, effectively destroys their ability to become those animals. So a deaf whale is unable to locate its kin, it's unable to find food, it's unable to find its own habitat and so forth. Therefore, the issue of ocean noise is a kind of existential one for whales. This narrative plays out in a number of different kinds of campaigns we see around the protection of whales. Uh, and, and there's a lot of legitimacy to this. I'm not questioning it. I'm just kind of bringing in the, the centrality of this issue. So you see the Guardian article on the north coast of BC where I did my work. Uh, Sonic Sea is a film made by the, uh, the NRDC, the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, which is a big lobby out of California. Uh, different kinds of campaigns with the NGO, such as WWF, have focused the ocean noise issue on whales, and, and so on and so forth. You know, you even have these campaigns with humpback whales wearing headphones to show that they need to be protected from loud construction sounds, such as, you know, uh, seismic drilling and air guns and so forth. And uh, resultingly, or relatedly, you know, there are, there are reasons why environmentalists have taken up the, the focus on whales. Um, you know, it generally draws a lot of public attention. But that film, for example, Sonic Sea, really does focus on the humpback whale and juxtaposes the song of the humpback whale with the deafening noise of uh, low-frequency shipping noise, which would cancel out our ability as, as listeners to actually detect that sound in some cases. And, you know, there's also the, the scientific issue, which I bring in the beginning here. Um, there's been a range of different impacts depending on the species, depending on the sound source, 
um, it's been a hugely productive form of science, uh, the question of the impact, that is to say. Uh, regulatory risk is related to that because um, in North America, which is where I focus my research, uh, there's been a legacy of environmental protections that have been activated or enabled by the emerging issue of ocean noise. The Species at Risk Act is a Canadian example. The Marine Animal Protection Act is the American analog. And these, these acts uh, protect whales from human disturbance, uh, initially from certain kinds of pollution uh, toxicities, but they've been amended and they've been litigated over to include noise. So that the, uh, the Species at Risk Act, for example, uh, had now includes a provision for acoustic habitat. So it protects um, killer whales or orca uh, in certain areas um, by dint of their acoustical habitat, that they need a certain area of frequencies to survive as that species. So this is a very powerful lobby, lobbying tool for uh, ocean noise campaigning. And then the more broad issue of, of green legitimacy, which is that you know, more and more uh, corporations and governments want to appear as good environmental citizens. And to uh, act on the whale issue with ocean noise is a good sign of that. So again, in the West Coast area where I look at my research, uh, the ports have been really big players in this. So the Vancouver port, the Los Angeles port have made big steps toward um, rewarding shipping agents who are going to be quieter when they enter the area to reduce noise, uh, to benefit the whales and so forth. You know, they'll give them priority berthing, for example, or they'll reduce their fees when they're actually at the, at the port itself. Uh, to demonstrate that they themselves are good environmental citizens. And again, there are these hotspots um, where ocean noise politics plays out with respect to whales. And my focus is on the British Columbia coast, but I think it's fitting that the previous uh, study was on the Baltic area because there's been a lot of uh, activity in the Baltic and the North Seas as well. And, and it actually, in many respects, there's been much better activity, um, not only because of OSFAR, but because of an, an initiative called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive in 2009, uh, set a cap on the amount of noise that you could be produced in a certain area. So this part of the world, in other words, Scandinavia, Germany, um, and parts of uh, Estonia, northern Estonia, or off the coast of Estonia, uh, it has been really good for ocean noise regulation. And it's been a kind of uh, an example around the world that people can look to. Um, Contrastingly, the west coast of BC is, I think, a much less uh, positive story in terms of the protection of, of whales from ocean noise, even though there's been a lot of attention there. And, and I'll get into the reasons why I think that's the case. But uh, suffice it to say that there's a lot of unevenness globally in the regulation of ocean noise, so that you have really strong examples in certain areas and then almost no regulation in other areas. And all this, of course, um, presupposes this problem that we have to deal with, which is that the ocean is getting louder. Um, this is a, a claim that really evolves out of the post-war period. Uh, as you can see by these graphs, uh, the, the ones that are charting upward, uh, really since the 1950s, you, you see this steady increase in uh, ocean noise levels. And in the top here, you see this amazing uh, kind of correlation between not only ocean noise or decibels, but also world GDP and world fleet gross tonnage, which is to say there is a very strong correlation between shipping GDP, which is to say the, the economy based on shipping and ambient noise. They're all exhibiting this steady rising increase. Um, and, and that's really an artifact of, of the, the work of, of military scientists who had all these hydrophones in the water to do military activity, to do submarine um, surveillance and so forth. They were picking up the noise almost by accident. They weren't looking for the noise. They were looking for submarines, but they found all these signatures of these ships, you know, which were traveling the oceans. And since then, there've been a range of studies that have looked back in those data sets and said, oh my God, we can find these connections. So you're seeing this strong concern around whales evolving out of this uh, attention to the fact that there is this rising tendency. Having said that, actually, before I, I continue, let me just show you another example uh, of this correlation. Um, on these two top images here, you see the shipping lanes that are being used globally. And then you see on the other one, the kind of bloom of color, the area of ocean noise activity. And it's pretty obvious uh, that the North Pacific is a very strong area for ocean noise. So that's the area that I've been looking at with my research. Uh, unfortunately, the images aren't aligned perfectly, or you'd be able to tell from the one on the left-hand side, on my left-hand side, that the shipping lanes are very much uh, concentrated in that part of the ocean as well. Uh, on, on a minor scale, on a, on a larger or on a smaller scale, the images on the bottom right-hand corner show what happens when you compare uh, shipping lane and noise activity across specific moments in time. So during the financial crisis of 2008-9, you did see a, an actual uh, decisive change in the amount of ocean noise produced off the coast of California. That's what these lines show here. 2008 and 2009, there's a difference there. Uh, 2008 is because of the crisis and the lack of shipping activity that year, and then 2009 is the resumption 
of that acti activity. And you can see the ocean noise increases. So it's another example of how strongly correlated shipping is with uh, ocean noise levels are. But yes, to return to the, the question mark I was about to raise, um, it's important, I think, to consider the fact that there are some who point to the idea that the ocean may not be simply getting louder, that that isn't the main problem that we should be thinking of. Michael Stalker is a biologist, an acoustician in California who I've actually interviewed a number of times. And he did this really interesting counterfactual study where he considered all the different baleen whales that were whaled uh, or taken out of uh, the ocean in the 1930s, 40s, prior to the 1960s, basically, and say, what if we had all those whales in the ocean calling at the strength of the frequencies that they call at? Well, there's a good um, you know, uh, hypothesis to consider that the ocean might have actually been louder in the early part of the 20th century before all this whaling took out huge populations of whales. And the reason this is important is I think not simply to think that the ocean isn't getting louder, because I think it is, and it's been getting louder since post-war, but that there's another sort of site to consider, which isn't simply decibels or volume, but also this sort of noise we've been dealing with in the last 50 years. So to put that in another um, set of terminologies, it isn't simply the quantity, it's the quality of sound, it's in the ocean right now, that's of concern. The quality of these impulsive sounds or these 24 seven droning sounds or these broadband noises that are being produced by industrial activity. Those sounds are really uh, a large part of the concern that biologists are finding in whales who have not been adapted you know, evolutionarily to listen to those kinds of sounds at those intensities. So the noise does matter, but the, or the volume does matter, but so does the quality or the formal properties of the sounds. That's what I think we should take away from Stalker's point that, you know, we might have had a loud ocean before, but it wasn't the damaging sounds to, in, to the whales that we now have with ocean noise and industrial activity. So I want to kind of consider the evolution of these three dynamics that I've been kind of gesturing to here, uh, economy, epistemology, and environment over a few historical uh, trajectories that will then converge into the final kind of few slides about present day stuff. The first is the Cold War period. So as I said before, um, the issue of ocean noise is not recent. The issue of ocean noise uh, is at least as old as the 1950s and 40s when military were really act active in studying the ocean and doing so to um, ultimately dominate the military battle space that was the ocean. And they were uh, constructing all these kinds of dragnets to listen to different frequencies in different areas. And the Pacific was a major area of concern for uh, the United States, of course, because of Russia, because of emerging concerns over Japan. And as a result, they had huge amounts of um, hydrophone arrays in the ocean. And they picked up a lot of different kinds of what they called biologicals. Whales were among those biologicals. But at the time, whales were not the desired signal. They were a form of noise. So there's this long history of study of whales almost by accident because the, uh, the military scientists realized that they needed to avoid those sounds or they needed to better understand those whale sounds if they wanted to get their desired signals of submarines. So this leads to some amazing histories, which I don't have time for, but among them is the fact that um, you had the discovery of whale music effectively by a military technician named Frank Watlington, who gave his recordings of, of these different humpback whale songs to these two scientists, Roger and Katie Payne in the 1960s, and Roger and Katie Payne went on to produce Songs of the Humpback Whale, which was in a million album selling LP. It's considered to be the greatest environmental sound album of all time. And of course, it's inspired a number of other spinoffs. So the military has this unlikely history in the sort of environmental celebration of whales, which is a sort of story that I talk about in one of my papers I'll, I'll get to at the end. But the key point is that um, there is a sort of signal noise relationship that's very uneven over the history of, of the study of whales and noise, wherein whales are at one point noise and then there's a signal sound and the signal sound of noise becomes a kind of noise in a different sense later on when the whales are uh, an item of environmental concern. It isn't until the 1990s that the issue of ocean noise as an industrial uh, source becomes really widespread, but it doesn't come out through shipping in particular, it comes out through sonar. So it's at this time that uh, you begin to get these studies that um, perhaps were mentioned by some of my colleagues. I, I wish I was there to have listened to them. But you, you, you see these studies um, arise in places like uh, Greece, the Bahamas, uh, Portugal, the Canary Islands, specifically in Spain, where scientists are finding these mass stranding events uh, of different kinds of beaked whales in, in particular. Uh, and they're finding them correlated to the presence of military destroyers who are using signals uh, into the ocean area to look for submarines or to communicate with other ships. 
So one of the, uh, another amazing story with the history of ocean noise, one of the first scientists who really found this problem and correlated it to military activity was a guy named Ken Balcom, who was himself an ex-Navy officer who had retired and was living in the Bahamas when he knew a, a destroyer was gonna circulate around the Bahamas where he lived. And he was able to sort of correlate the discovery of these beaked whales, it's actually the top photo here, with uh, the presence of these military destroyers. So this prompts uh, environmentalists to can take the ocean noise issue seriously and they move effectively from the uh, sound of the sort of sonar and the impulse sounds to the more pervasive sound of shipping noise. And that's where you get to the early 2000s. You get to see this explosion of studies really take off um, following work uh, by people like Michael Jasney to kind of collect some of the earlier work. Uh, and Chris Clark's work uh, was among the most influential. Chris Clark, uh, who also had history in military, uh, did this uh, important study in 2009 in which he looked at what was called the um, opportunity area, the listening area of a gray whale, and how much it would shrink in the presence of chronic industrial noise. So there's these two dots, you can see them, I'll show you in another image next. Um, well, you can see them right here, actually. Um, the reduced dot is the effective sound area that the animal could listen to um, in the presence of the shipping noise. So it's a drastically reduced navigational area that it, um, is being produced by uh, all the shipping noise in the ocean for this particular species. Another really important study came out in 2012 by Roland et al. And what her work did was look at um, the cortisone levels of certain whales post 9-11. So again, there's an economic relationship here. After 9-11, all these ships are grounded, all these planes are grounded, and whales exhibit changing cortisone levels, which to the scientists reveal changing stress levels. So this becomes one of the first studies it was an opportunistic study because of the fact that 9-11 that proved that you know, drastically different stress levels are being uh, evaluated or measured in these animals depending on the presence of all this shipping activity. Uh, and then there's more studies coming out in the 2000s that kind of elaborate more and more fine-tuned insights. Valveers et al. in 2016 consider the fact that harmonics from ship noise actually impact animals which we normally think of as higher frequency specialists. So if killer whales are listening in higher frequencies and humpback whales are listening in lower frequencies, the initial thought was, well, the lower frequency sound will only impact the lower frequency listener, AKA the humpback. But what, what Valveers and all looked at is how there's harmonics being produced by that shipping noise signature as well. And those harmonics are actually impacting the killer whale at those higher frequencies. So all this is to say, and it's also being joined by all this other kind of in, in interesting work on other species and fish and coral and porpoise, that there's now a huge explosion of work in the early 2000s, mid 2000s around ocean noise and marine mammals, whales, but also other species. And I think this image here will help kind of uh, capture some of the differences. In the 90s, you had impulse sounds, you had single point sounds from military sonar, what were considered to be very measurable impacts because you had these strandings. In the early 2000s, you had this chronic multi-point source issue of shipping, right? It's coming from hundreds of ships that are transiting at different speeds, going through different areas. It's harder to measure. It actually inspires uh, new kinds of measurement. And that's where I want to go next, because that gets back to the question of the economy. But another key difference is that, whereas in the 90s, it was considered a kind of scientific specialist issue, by the early 2000s, it really becomes a global environmental problem. And that's where we're at today, is I think we're still kind of trying to grapple with the, the globality of this issue and how it's differently articulated in different areas of the world. And this is just an image uh, which captures some of the wealth of studies that I, I referred to, but that are also available to look at elsewhere. Just all these compilations coming out, all this different kind of summary work, trying to make sense of the different studies that are being undertaken in different parts of the world. Right, so um, before I can get to the kind of concern I would wanna raise around the economy, we need to look at some of the regulatory responses that are being taken. Because states are being pressured as the issue becomes a global environmental issue, straight states are being pressured into doing something about it, to improving their uh, regulatory systems. And one of the first um, kind of systems that gets evolved is um, working around a kind of frequency band methodology. Uh, where you can see quite clearly here that you know these different bands correlate to the different response areas of these animals. Uh, so you know fish are between you know are about 90 hertz and one kilohertz, and different whale species kind of cover the range between nine hertz and you know 12,000 kilohertz and so forth. And shipping has one area of, of response as well. So the idea was that if you just match up these signatures, you could figure out what animal is being affected by what sound source. So a higher frequency noise would affect a fish and it might not affect a lower frequency specialist like a blue whale. 
Um, but as these uh, responses were being articulated by the regulators, uh, they came under a lot of critique. Uh, so a lot of scientists were, were calling into question the simplicity of these methods because they, they presuppose things like the idea that an animal could only really hear well at one frequency or that the animal was moving in one direction and therefore you could just anticipate where to stop the sound source when in fact the animal may be moving in different directions depending on the season of the transit and so forth. So all this regulatory concern inspires an economic pushback or an economic innovation, which is really where I want to go. Uh, here's another example of just how it differentiates spatially as well as uh, with respect to species, right? So, you know, in the Vancouver coast area, different animals would call for different regulatory solutions. Right, so you begin to see in the 2010s or so, uh, a kind of huge uh, flourishing of economic activity of, um, you know, innovation to help fine tune the study in the problem area of ocean noise for whales. And in ways that are, I think, in many ways quite laudable and positive, but also in ways that don't always solve the problem in question. You, you have these courses that are being designed for shipping agents to demonstrate good fidelity to regulate, regulation. They may not actually have a demonstrative impact on the shipping agent's conduct because there's no regulation that says you can't move here or there. It's all voluntary guidelines. You have new technology firms coming online and selling their, um, you know, their, their wares on the global market and creating huge profit because they're creating money for the shipping agents to, you know, uh, again, appear as good, good actors in the environment, but not necessarily doing so in ways that are reducing uh, ocean noise globally or even in areas that are really needing it, such as the West Coast. And again, many of my examples draw from the West Coast because that's where I've been focusing on. So I don't always want to make the claim that they're being applicable everywhere. So here's a sort of summary of what you're beginning to see by the 2010s or so. New markets in relation to technologies, uh, international regulators creating uh, you know, important steps toward regulation, but not creating binding agreements. So creating non-binding agreements with voluntary stipulations. Uh, and more economic list language for science, which I think sociologists would point to as a problematic thing for the idea of actually prioritizing the environment over the economy because it creates an environmental logic in the economy rather than actually solving the problem of, of over environmental or over exploitation of, of the environment. Uh, and these, these terminologies which are really trying to mix and match shipping and whales rather than just protecting whales. So Williams et al. Uh, created this idea of what they call opportunity areas, which is to um, protect the acoustic status quo of areas which haven't been shipped yet rather than to protect areas which are already shipped but have a lot of whales. They're kind of saying effectively that those areas can't be saved because the shipping logic, law lobbies are too powerful to remove them from those areas. Rather, we should look for opportunities elsewhere. And this is a problematic thing, of course, if you're a biologist looking to protect a certain species or if you're an environmentalist looking to protect a certain species. And then incentivization schemes uh, like green marine uh, and clear seas, which um, again, uh, create the appearance of green legitimacy but don't necessarily solve the problem of noise. And then port authorities are, are doing similar work as well. So um, my question in one of the papers I will uh, cite at the very end of here is, you know, does the mainstreaming of the ocean noise issue foster solutions to the fundamental drivers of the problem, which in the case of shipping are quite clear, uh, an increase of shipping linked to consumption levels, linked to global demand. Uh, this isn't a problem, of course, that's easy to solve, but I think it's the simplest way to solve ocean noise, which is unique in global environmental problems, because once you stop the propellers, you effectively stop the problem which is to say if we had less ships moving around and less gross tonnage uh, you know, in the global economy, we would very likely have less noise. There are studies which show that certain ships are, are louder ships and that you know, if we just took out those louder ships, that would be better. But I think that it's a, it's a more difficult problem than, one to say, than, one, than is to say less ships would just be better for everybody. And that would be to adopt the precautionary approach and to reduce overall shipping volumes. And an object lesson for all of this is, I think, a work uh, of sociology by Richard York in 2017, which looks at whaling and how, at the time um, of petroleum innovation, people thought that this would be a good thing for whales. That is to say, when petroleum became a mainstream um, commodity, they thought, okay, whale oil will decline in demand. That will actually protect whales because they won't be as hunted. But in fact, the opposite happened. Uh, the, the, main, the main lining of petroleum actually increased the whaling of many of the populations who are now decimated. And it did so because of the dynamics of economic behavior. It did so because of the way that there was a new regulatory uh, horizon created for whaling. People thought we better whale as quickly as possible before all the regulation comes online. And they also thought you know, um, that there's a, a new way of marketizing the innovations that are being created through whaling because you could circulate um, 
you could circulate the commodities uh, in a global market. So in other words, his point is that technology doesn't actually reduce um, in the way we might think um, the demand for certain commodities if it doesn't come alongside regulatory and social changes, which I think I, my previous speaker spoke to quite well, that you know, good regulation can do a lot and that can be paired with technology, but technology by itself is insufficient. So returning to the three examples, environmental, epistemological, and economic, my point wasn't that these are all separate, but that they intertwine in interesting ways and in different ways, and that we need to attend to all three uh, if we were to understand the sort of strong relationship between whales and ocean noise as an environmental problem. And I'll just leave it on this slide. This is um, some of the work I've done on this topic, and I'd be happy to discuss any of it more. Uh, the, the first piece here, I should also say, uh, is actually a sound art piece. And I mentioned that in part because the next speaker I know is doing work on um, the kind of resensing of the environment that we may need to undertake to really reconsider the problem more critically and more radically than we are at, at the current stage. Thank you very much.